Uh, next, we're going to turn to State of U.S. National Security. We're uh, very grateful to have representatives Chrissy Houlihan and Don Bacon and uh, conservator Rye Barkat, C- excuse me, the co-founder and CEO of With Honor to get us started. So I'll invite them on up to the stage. I don't know where, there they are. Couldn't see you. I was like, this is a setup. <laughs> Thanks, guys. This is my best presentation. Oh, I see. Yeah. It's a little bit of a That's all right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> all right, where are we? Good morning, everybody. How are you? Good morning. Terrific. Well, uh, the morning started off well uh, for, for me. I was uh, with another colleague of Congressman Bacon and Hula Hands, who are, serves on the Four Country Caucus. Uh, we had a nice morning workout with uh, Representative Jason Crow and uh, Seth Mullen, who gave us a, a traditional Marine Corps Daily 7. Uh, you guys want to start off with some neck rolls or something? Uh, just keep the blood flowing for this? Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. He's in bed. <laughs> <You're> right, yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, it's a it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, Peter Dixon is also a co-founder of With Honor, so Peter it was really nice to see that um, that kickoff, and great to see what what you and your colleagues have built here in order to help modernize our uh, national security infrastructure. Uh, Peter and I co-founded With Honor about five years ago. I served in the Marines from 2001 to 2006. I was a CI human officer with uh, a couple of years ahead of Mike Gallagher, and then Seth Mullen and I served at the basic school together. And about five years ago, we looked at the state of Congress and we saw that the uh, percentage of veterans in Congress had hit a near all-time low, it was slightly below 20%. And I knew a number of friends of mine who I'd served with uh, and some who I was just getting to know that were uh, uh, putting their name in the arena to run for office again, including uh, Congresswoman Houlihan. And of course, Congressman Bacon was, was I believe, on his second term, heading into his second term. And our, our approach as an organization has really been a simple one, which is that let's uh, try and lower the barriers of entry for principled veterans who are committed to putting the country first and working across party lines in an environment that's very difficult to do that. Uh, and so over the last five years, there have been a total of now 30 members in the four country caucus, which is a bipartisan caucus that uh, Congressman Bacon and Houlihan uh, founded and led uh, for the first term. It's now led by uh, Congressman Jason Crow and Tony Gonzalez. Each term, the leadership has uh, rotated. The vice chairs this year are Marionette Miller Meeks and Mikey Sherrill. And um, that, that organization, the caucus, uh, has passed over 79 laws in national security, national service, and veterans affairs. We'll talk about some of that uh, today. We've got a fair amount of ground to cover in 30 minutes. So we're going to start with technology, and then we're going to talk about military quality of life and some really exciting developments that Congressman Bacon uh, is, is leading there, and, and perhaps Congresswoman Houlihan will also be involved with, with that front. And, uh, and then we'll wrap up with a, um, uh, just a few comments on the overall state of affairs with trying to get bipartisan work that matters done for the country at a, at a time of significant uncertainty. Sound good? All right, great. All right, so uh, the first question to dump, jump into, I think, would be uh, just a biographical one. Uh, Congressman Bacon served for 30 years in the Air Force, retired as a Brigadier General, and is now the Congressman for Nebraska's 2nd District. Congresswoman Houlihan is, I believe, the only member of Congress that I'm aware of that has served both in the military as well as as a teacher. Uh, she earned a, a master's degree in, in technology and policy from MIT. IT, uh, went to Stanford, where she got her ROTC degree, served in the Air Force, and then was a chemistry teacher for a number of years. Um, I've also really enjoyed getting to know uh, her husband, Bart. Uh, she and her husband, Bart, helped co-found the B Corps movement uh, in the United States, which is uh, really inspiring. So she's known what it's been like to be an entrepreneur, and now she's a member of Congress. And maybe, uh, uh, Congresswoman Houlihan, if I could start with you and just um, ask a question about what, what motivated you to uh, jump in the arena and uh, serve again in this, this capacity. Is this on? 
Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you, Rai, for helping organize this bipartisan group, and thank you to the symposium for having us. A uh, really important conversation. In terms of what motivates me, it's service. It's fundamentally what I've tried to do throughout my life. I came from a military family. My dad and my grandfather were Navy. Um, in fact, my dad met my mom because he was in my grandfather's squadron, and so he married the boss's daughter. Um, and so military service is obviously fundamental and core to who I am and my family is, but also service writ large is very important. And as Rye mentioned, um, served in Teach for America and the, Ameri and the AmeriCorps program as a chemistry teacher in North Philadelphia, but also tried in my entrepreneurial ventures to grow businesses that were not only very profitable, but also did very good things for community, for the planet, and for our team and employees. And that's where the B Corps movement came from. Um, I worry about the country, and that's the reason why I was motivated to run for office. I felt with a background in defense and all also in entrepreneurism in business and also in education. It was a useful skill set to bring in a really divided time to our country. So I serve in the 6th Congressional District in Pennsylvania, which is just outside of Philly. It's one of those purple places, 40, 40, 20, R, D, and I, in terms of voter registration. Um, and I'm hopeful that I'm working hard to uh, unify our community and also the Commonwealth and also this country. Awesome. Thanks, uh, Chrissy. Don, uh, similar question on, on just what motivated you to serve again in, in uh, elected office. I've always liked the military history. So as a young young kid, um, reading about Grant, Eisenhower, uh, loved it. And I also like liked reading about politics. And I like dirt bikes. And I still do all three today. So I've, I've never changed. But I, I was campaigning for Reagan uh, at 13 years old. And I was doing county races. And I joined the Air Force because uh, I had a just an affinity for military leadership and wanting to read about it and get to see it. So it made sense to join. But the day I retired, I gave a speech for a local congressman and I got involved, you know, like l literally the night that I retired and uh, we haven't stopped there, but I, you know, what really motivates me. I love our country. We live in this great nation. I love our history. I love the freedoms that we have, but I also know for us to remain strong and vi vibrant, we have to be involved and we can't just let's, you know, the, activists control everything or the you know the special interest i think everyday americans have to be involved have their voice heard and that's what motivated me to get in i wanted to love our country i want to make sure that someday my kids and grandkids and great grandkids inherit this freedom the free market system and the ability to move up and achieve their dreams through hard work and character and that's what i want to preserve Thanks, Don. Well, you, you, I strive to learn something new every day, and I think I've got my at least one learning up early this morning. Uh, I'm, I'm envisioning you on a dirt bike. Uh, this is I not. Was a I was pretty good as a team. I, I was, I was the best of them in the neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, both uh, Don and Chrissy, in addition to their military service, share now in common being one of the two of the most bipartisan members in Congress. They've also they are also at the top of the. Uh, the index that measures congressional effectiveness every year. And I think that's an attribute not only to who they are, but also to, to how they lead and their staffs. And I know that uh, Colonel Pat Flood, who served with uh, Congressman Bacon in the Air Force, is here with us today. And um, and both uh, working with both of their teams has just been a, a real delight in, in seeing how you, you get things done. Um, so let's turn to getting things done. Uh, one of the only bipartisan acts that uh, has routinely passed in Congress in the last few decades is the National Defense Authorization Act. We sure hope that will continue to be uh, the way that it goes goes uh, this year. And um, why don't we start by just asking about priorities for this year? What are you seeing as, as members of the House Armed Services Committee? Last uh, Congress, there were a number of priorities, China, AI, uh, Russian aggression, um, hypersonics, service member welfare, and platform modernization, uh, specifically fossil 5G. So a lot, obviously, we're covering lots of ground. The moving, the world's moving very fast. As you look at the 2024 NDAA, uh, how have some of those priorities e evolved? Um, have you seen some changes? What's your sort of outlook um, looking into this year's NDAA? Um, so. Go ahead. You know, the challenge we have is we had 20 years of I Iraq and Afghanistan. We didn't invest like in a, the three legs of the triad, you know, our, our nuclear deterrence. We didn't invest in the number of F-22s we wanted in the Air Force. We, we're, we're behind. And now we're steering, as Peter said, we're 
We have, we have the, the threat today, Russia, the threat tomorrow, China. We cannot do it alone. We, we are the indispensable nation, but it's going to take a, a lot of a lot, a close partnership with our allies to, to, to pull this off. But we have tons of stuff we got to buy, and we don't have the budget to do it. That's the bottom line. And so I think the challenge is rather do the three legs of the triad. We do have hypersonics. We have AI, the 5G. We, you go on and on. The military can't do it unless they put in some of their fourth generation. You know, they, they have to get rid of some of the older systems. But here, so here's the challenge. We're going to have to do all this while the military is going to lose 500 aircraft in the Air Force in the next five years. Our Navy is going to decline in a number of ships. At the same time, we're trying to get ready for China and Russia. It doesn't really make sense, but the budget is such where if you want to get all these, the AI, the hypersonics, the fifth generation weapons, you're going to have to get rid of old systems to do it. It's really put us in a bind through between now and the next five years. I think if we get through it, we'll, we'll start seeing the increase in enough 35s and everything else. We'll, we'll, we'll get. But that's our challenge. How do you buy all this fifth generation high-end weapons with the budget that we have? And it's a, it's a very hard. So I would echo what Don is talking about in terms of the things that we need to be investing in and in terms of sort of flushing out the things that we no longer need to have or, uh, or have for whatever reason become obsolete. But what I would also add to the conversation is the people um, to make sure that we have the high quality, high caliber um, uniformed people and those who support us um, in the right places at the right time. And we really are struggling with that particular challenge in this uh, in this uh, military right now, and frankly, across all of industry as well, and the civilian sector too, we just don't have well-trained enough, qualified enough people and enough of them to be able to sit and do the kinds of things that we're asking them to do and to think in the ways that we're asking them to think. Um, I think one of the things that struck me is um, I wasn't able to go on this trip, but another friend of mine did to Poland recently and to talk to a lot of folks who were kind of coming out of Ukraine and who were learning how to use different technologies that we were providing and the thing that struck her was just how innovative, creative, and agile the Ukrainians were, and how her reflection was that she wasn't so certain we could have been that way. And that's really kind of worrisome. Um, and so STEM and STEAM, you know, um, backgrounds and, and education is really, really important. Um, one of the things we got in the NDA three years ago actually was to try to understand why it is that we are, have such a high fail rate for people who want to be in our military. I think only 30% of people who act actively are interested in being in the military end up being qualified in one way, shape, or form in terms of tests, either physical or mental. Uh, and we are trying to understand what where is the failing point there. And as a former teacher, I can tell you the failing point is in education. Um, we are not teaching our kids the kinds of skills that they need right now, and that's uh, going to affect our readiness. Let's uh, let's dive into that in a in just one moment. And if we could though stay on the on the tech front uh, for for a minute, uh, many in this room have been involved with DIU, uh, which of course uh, got its start a number of years ago. Uh, Peter Dixon and others were involved in that. The the DIU funding increased; it doubled, but it's still a very small number. I think it was something like eighty million in last year's um, twenty twenty three NDAA. Uh, that is just one area, of course, of in throughout DOD where we, there's an emphasis on innovation and technological development. How much of a conversation is this within uh, HASC and among the members? Or, or is there an emphasis on uh, modernizing our defense infrastructure? Does DIU as a specific entity come up in, in some of the conversations? Uh, I think that there's a lot of conversation about innovation, and DIU is certainly part of that conversation. I think, though, to be really transparent, there's a lot of, um, as Peter said earlier, there's just a lot of solutions out there looking for, you know, a place to be exercised. And I think that that's the confusing part is that um, Congress only knows what we know, and we have to kind of understand what it is that's most useful to help you guys in industry and to help us, you know, in terms of our, our requirements planning. I came when I was in the military, I was um, a project or program manager up at Hanscom Air Force Base, and I was working on advanced systems and advanced plans and programs. And the, my my job was supposed to be to work on things that would be in the field 20 years later, 20 to 25 years later. And 
now 30 something years later, I am aghast that that still seems to be the way that we run program management. We don't have 20, 25 years to get stuff into the field. And so I think things like DIU are really important in making sure that we elevate and fund them. And But I also think that there's a confusing sub space of all these other kinds of things like that, that I'm, I'm not certain we've done a good job of, of uh, centralizing or understanding. One of the things that concerns me, and I talked to a lot of small businesses or just startups, and we're giving them seed money, and then they die because they, they don't, the, the transition doesn't occur. So we're going to have to do a better job of not just giving out some seed money to start and then, you know, just letting them then just stop the funding. And I got example after example like that. And what we have is a very fragmented process. There's not a, there's not a good compass to what we're doing. And, and I saw the DI, DIU will help us. Uh, but also, as you know, we're trying to start a, uh, a technical commission where the executive branch will have somebody in charge trying to pile this together, not just the defense, but also with the State Department, Commerce, Treasury, you name it. We need to have something that sort of integrates us. It's so fragmented right now. If we can do a little better job, you know, uh, shepherding this, we'll be we'll do it. So what we try to do this in the defense bill. Uh, the Science and Technology Committee wanted the leadership on it. So this year, we're going to try to get that bill passed. Great. And I, I think that's uh, related to, the, of course, the Technology Competitiveness Council, which was one of about 80 recommendations from the National Security Commission on AI that um, Eric Schmidt and Bob Work uh, established, along with others, uh, a few years ago. Uh, the Four Country Caucus was, is, has really engaged heavily in that and helped pass about a dozen of those recommendations. This is one that's still still out there. And what we've seen, of course, in, in this town is that it takes persistence in order to get uh, anything done, especially in a highly polarized environment. Um, how's, how's the outlook for that particular uh, bipartisan bill? So one of the freshman members on the Science and Technology is going to take this up. It'll be our, the same bill, but he'll put it in the Science and Technology Committee. I think there's a lot of support for it. It's bipartisan. And we need it. Uh, there, we need someone. It's like, you know, the NSC for security, but this is going to be a similar shape for trying to guide our technology and and uh, putting a strategy together that ties all the departments together. So I think there'll be great support for it. Great, great. Well, we'll we'll continue to push uh, on our end from with honor, and then of course, great to have the Four Country Caucus of thirty members. Uh, actively engaged in it. Another uh, exciting bill that was recently uh, introduced was by uh, uh, Congresswoman Houlihan that that re re you know really speaks to this and in investing in small businesses that are tech focused for our defense infrastructure. Uh, you introduced it with another uh, a fellow uh, Republican veteran and. Um, could you maybe share a little bit about this? Which of these two bills? I'm there are two that I'm totally excited about. One is the STEM Restart Act. Yep, let's Excuse do both. me. And speaking about the importance of uh, workforce and workforce development, the STEM Restart Act has been reintroduced again as well uh, with another four country member, um, Representative Baird, and with Rep uh, Senator Rosen and Senator Hyde Smith. And basically what this is, again, speaking to the importance of workforce and workforce development, and frankly, women in the workforce or those who take time uh, to do other things uh, or may have ducked in and out of the workforce, the Restart Act offer, offers the opportunity for returnships for people to be able to come back into workplaces, particularly small and mid-sized workplaces. Um, I know that when I was a young person, I had my first child when I was 23, when I was active duty and my next when I was 25, when I was uh, at MIT, uh, and it was hard. It was really, really hard to maintain, you know, kind of a, a, a presence in the workforce while also raising small children. So I'm excited about the Restart Act and excited very much about the bipartisanship uh, with that. Senator Rosen is also on the second bill, which I think that you were talking about, uh, which has got a longer enough name that I feel like I need to make sure I read it. Investing in American Defense Technologies Act. Uh, this is also with Senator Blackburn, as well as um, on our side, uh, Representative Fallon. And this is a legislation that talks to the issue that we were just talking about, which is making sure that we have sort of public private Private relationships and opportunities to be able to, to capitalize and fund these kinds of small businesses with their ideas and, and reduce and minimize the risk that they have in, in innovating in these ideas. I will share with you that my future son-in-law is a literal rocket scientist, and he works at a um, small startup satellite, microsatellite company, and his and his partner's interest in engaging in defense uh, contracts is 
really remarkable to watch, which is it's a relatively apathetic non-interest um, because it's just too hard. You know, this stuff is too hard and they're getting capital other places and they're getting customers other places and their technology can be used in other places. And we are all at a loss because of that. So these kinds of uh, pieces of legislation and these kinds of working groups and, and uh, commissions are important to help us uh, combat that. So, you know, the DOD funding is so unpredictable. It makes it hard for these small startups. We, we got to do better. And cash flow. We've also put some legislation in place in the last several uh, NDAAs to try to accelerate uh, payments. Um, this is cash is king. You know, no, every business survives on its cash flow. Uh, and the idea when I was in the uh, in the teaching world, I ran a nonprofit that uh, relied on government uh, money, uh, Title One money, and it took us in some cases six months to receive payment. We cannot survive as a business, a small business, when it's net six months. Um, and so we're trying to make sure that also we're addressing just the plain old, you know, where does your cash come from and when do you get it? So two really smart pieces of legislation. They have four corners. Uh, that is two lead uh, Republican, a Republican and a Democrat in both the Senate and the House. Uh, that's a great start. But passing anything in Congress is hard. You are all here. You all have a vested interest in in doing things that matter for the country. You probably have interests in, in advancing things that are specific to your business. If either of those two or other pieces of legislation that are not necessarily specific for your business, but are just important for the country, please think about ways that you can amplify the, the, the oxygen behind them, because the communications is really important. It's an important piece to getting anything done in this town, uh, especially to passing into law and getting through the, the NDAA. So that's a, it's something that you can do uh, in this uh, in this room. And please feel free to follow up with um, with me or anybody uh, on, on the panel here. And uh, Congresswoman Houlihan uh, rep uh, mentioned Representative Jim Baird. Thanks for doing that. Uh, most of the members of the Four Country Caucus are Afghanistan and Iraq uh, era veterans. Uh, Jim Baird is one of the last members of the uh, veterans in, in Congress who's a Vietnam veteran. And he lost his arm in combat, heavy combat, and just um, uh, teamed up with another uh, uh, Democratic member who was a Vietnam veteran, Mike Thompson, uh, for the 50th anniversary of that, that very difficult war. Uh, he went on to earn a, a Ph.D., uh, in, uh, I believe, agrarian science um, from, from rural... He loves smart. soybeans. Soybeans, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and That's how you get to his heart. Talk about soybeans. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and uh, and was uh, one thing that I love, too, We in, uh, with honor, we have a pledge, which is to serve with integrity, civility, and courage. And uh, Jim Baird really passed that one with flying colors, as does, uh, of course, uh, Congresswoman Houlihan and, and uh, Bacon. Uh, but in his case, he actually won a civility award when he was a state legislator in in Illinois. They have they have such a thing. It would be it would be a better state of affairs if every state introduced that. Um, let's shift a bit. There's a lot that we could go into on 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 tech. Uh, the Four Country Caucus has been invited to a demonstration and briefing uh, with Sam Altman uh, of OpenAI today, along with the members of the bipartisan uh, House and Senate committee, that AI is moving so, so rapidly. Um, and we can dive into that in a moment. But I want to make sure we have some time to talk about uh, Don's leadership on the military quality of life uh, panel and 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 uh, jurisdiction that you're about to step into. The, 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 the overall group has not been named yet, but it's uh, possible that you all will be working together. I understand on that as well. And uh, Don, could you tell us a little bit about this? So we got us started on this. We heard Last year, about some of our more junior enlisted members, if they're married, they're on SNAP program. That's unacceptable. You know, our, our military having E2s, E3s, we're married on SNAP. And so I went to Mike Rogers, say, you may be the chairman uh, next cycle, but we got to take this on. And, he, and he, so then he stood up in the conference like a week later. My number one, you know, my number one priority is to get our young enlisted guys off SNAP. I go, I think, I think it registered. <laughs> so it's a good sign. We also have had problems with housing. Now, we've been cutting, if, if let's say that you qualify for $1,000 for housing allowance at base X, the military takes 5% out of that. It doesn't make sense. So you're, you're forcing folks to dig into their pay to pay for the rent or whatever it may be in their utilities. And that, you know, that leads to also, you know, exacerbates the food insecurity in this case. But also the, the housing on base, the folks who get housing allowance, that money goes to the, those privatized owners, which means... There's a 5% cut that's less maintenance, uh, less modernization down in those military homes. 
And as we keep you know peeling the onion back here, we have a year-long waiting list on average for daycare. Uh, I was 30 years in. My, I moved my wife 16 times. Very hard for spouses to get jobs. So we want to work with maybe the Chambers of Commerce to partner at every base to help spouses uh, get jobs. So these are just some of the things we're working on. But as Chrissy said, we have, we're not m making our recruitment or our, ret our retention goals. And I don't think quality of life is the only factor here, but it's a big one. And so it's within our power to make significant improvements here so that we can take that off the table. There's other factors that we have to deal with too on recruiting, re recruitment and retention, but this is surely something we could do better. Not a single service men or women should be on SNAP, period. So we're going to tackle that. And I am uh, very, very optimistic that I'll be able to join Don in this adventure because as I started the conversation, uh, military families are uh, my heart and soul having moved as well 12 times as a small person uh, and transitioned schools 12 different times as well. Uh, military kids also are, you know, important to making sure that we're taking care of them and their education and so that and their mental health as well. And as you mentioned, spouses, my mom is the smartest one in our whole family and she moved every single year and you know when I started graduate uh, undergraduate school she finished her graduate degree because she had pieced it together over the course of the 12 years that I was growing up through you know pre, uh, in school and so we have a lot of work to do in this area and I am very optimistic and hopeful that I'll be able to be helpful there and this should not be politicized this is just the people who serve us you know the armed services committee is a, one of the most bipartisan committees it may be the most bipartisan committee out there, but this is going to be the most bipartisan, so part of the most bipartisan committee. I don't think this is not a Republican Democrat issue. Uh, we've had people from the all spectrums of the political ideology want to be part of this. I'm excited about it. It's going to be, going to be great work. I think we're going to get great things done. It's terrific. And of course, it, it, it one of the end goals here is both uh, making uh, and keeping America uh, competitive and keeping our D Department of Defense strong, but also seeing more Americans serve. And I know this has been a passion area for both of you. Uh, Chrissy is uh, vice chair of the National Security uh, National Service Caucus. Uh, with honor in the four country caucus helped push through the first major expansion of AmeriCorps in over 20 years, a couple of years ago with Senator Chris Coons and Roger Wicker. Uh, Senator Wicker is now part of an uh, affiliation of six senators bipartisan that we've formed in the Senate to, to pass legislation that matters. Um, maybe, Chrissy, could you share a little bit of your perspective on, on national Sure. Service? I think that uh, one of the things that I try to talk about a lot is the fact that service just isn't wearing a uniform, that it is also all other kinds of things, such as being in AmeriCorps, City or Peace Corps, you know, uh, any sort of VISTA thing, or being uh, my my brother's an ER nurse in Iowa, uh, a teacher, all of those kinds of things are of service. And we need to make sure that we are finding more ways for more people to serve um, and incentivizing them to do that because we need them. And so we should make sure that our lens is much more broad than just simply having a uniform on when we're talking about how we bring people together. And with an analogy from the chemistry uh, classroom, I have this kind of vision in my mind that we're all sort of siloed in our various beakers and that we're not necessarily being, uh, we're not reacting, we're not colliding, the molecules aren't coming together. And in that reason why is that we're siloed in our little beakers in our little, uh, you know, Facebook messenger or whatever we're in, we need to not only have people serve just because it's helpful to the nation, but it's also helpful to the individual to see people who are different than them too. So I'm really passionate about this. And what's interesting about Congress is that there tends to be groups that focus on uniform service, and then there tend to be groups that focus on other kinds of service, but they almost don't talk. Um, and it's really remarkable. And we need to find a way to push those two groups together. Thanks. Don, any good? Uh, good. Uh, Great. Uh, so, uh, Chrissy, uh, we were introduced by Lila Ibrahim, who has been the chief operating officer for DeepMind uh, for, for a number of years. And, of course, you have a very unique perspective as a scientist and an entrepreneur. Uh, and uh, with Don, would love your perspective on this as well. But the state of play has just moved so quickly with, with AI since the, the introduction of ChatGPT and now, of course, um, other platforms uh, uh, introducing their technologies. What we're hearing a lot about is that there should be guardrails um, and industry leaders are, are calling for guardrails, even some that are very uh, historically resistant to any type of additional regulatory frameworks. What, 
what is your view on this? What and and do you have a do you know what some of those guardrails might look like? So this is uh, I'm smiling because um, there tends to be sort of flavors of the day in Congress. And like a while ago, the flavor of the moment became rare earth and critical minerals. And like I'd been squawking about that for you know a while. And then everybody thought it was really important. And then supply chains. My background is in supply chain management. And when you have a pandemic, all of a sudden, everybody's like, ah! You know, um, now everybody in this room and in this country knows what a supply chain is as a result of the of the pandemic. AI is the next you know flavor of the day. This week alone, I think I have four different AI you know meetings, um, and that goes from zero to four. You know, there were, have been none in the first five years that I've been here, um, and this is where it's really important when we talk about you know having the right people at the table. You mentioned that there's only. 20% of people who are in, in the government, in the, in, in the body that are veterans, only about 24 of us have STEM or STEAM backgrounds in the 435 people who are in Congress. And that's a problem. We need to recruit more people who have STEM and STEAM backgrounds too, because the pace of this is really, really quick. Embracing and understanding it, it is really, really important. We don't have a lot of time. And so I don't know is the answer to that. What, is, what does AI guardrail look like? I don't think we have an idea of what we could all agree on at this point. And I don't think we have the appetite or bandwidth to do anything either, which is even more horrifying. I it, let's end on a positive note though, because we've I'm got your I, I, and I've got, I've got, a, I've got a good tee up for this. I, I saw that the, we got three minutes left. So, um, uh, Chrissy, could you please tell us the fantastic story about how you got paid family leave through and its connection to rare earth minerals? Because, and this is ties directly into the topic of the day with debt ceiling, because how do you pay for something in government? Well, here's an example of getting something done. This is a crazy, crazy ass story. And I was just, a, uh, sorry, uh, I was just a freshman and I was interested in critical minerals and, and critical mineral supplies and uh, supply chains. And so had a piece of uh, legislation in the NDAA that had to do with making sure we understood where all of those critical minerals were coming from and what we had of them. And also where we had some abundance in one particular place where we had abundance was tungsten. So this was a piece of legislation that would have gotten to that information and also sold off some of our tungsten. Also, very importantly, I'm passionate as you are of, as well about issues of child care, issues of parental leave and, and that sort of thing. So had some uh, legislation in the NDAA about that too. Well, fast forward, we found out that we were going to be able to get that tungsten legislation pushed forward. We were going to be able to sell that for a pretty penny. And we had some money all of a sudden. Chairman Smith at the time uh, recognized that this was an opportunity. And he gave me a call and asked me if I could, if I would be willing to give him the, the money that we shook loose from tungsten to be able to help begin to pay for parental leave for federal employees. And he thought that there was an opportunity to be able to do that because Ivanka Trump was interested in doing that as well. Um, and so long story short, we basically traded rare earth minerals for the beginning of a pay for to be able to have paid parental leave for 2.1 million federal employees. And now 2.1 million federal employees have access to paid leave because we sold tungsten. Um, and so that's how the magic is made in Washington. <laughs> that's how the sausage is made. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, that this is about to wrap up our panel, but maybe uh, just the final softball uh, for 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 folks in this room. How can they how can they help? What would you like to see them doing? Uh, we have a room full of entrepreneurs, military veterans, uh, people that really care a lot about the country uh, across party lines. John, we, we need to hear from you. I, I learned. I mean, served as an electronic warfare guy for you know thirty years. I, I have a, a range of military experiences. It's raised on a farm, but there's a thousand different issues out there. I may be smart on 20 or 30. We learn from you every time you come in to talk and share what you're working on. And uh, we have a great team that tries to feed into the NDAA if, it's, if, that, if that's appropriate for what you're working on. But we're smarter and better when people come in and chat with what's important to you and how we can, how we can help you because that's how we help the country. So engage us, engage our, our teams and you make us better. I would echo that. We have a really open door policy. I don't, I think that there's this, um, 
I think, a misconception that somehow advocacy or lobbying is bad. It's really important. You, you have to come and talk to us because, as Don said, there's so many things we're trying to keep track of. Every Congress, there's about eight to 9,000 pieces of legislation that are introduced, and only a few hundred of them might actually see the light of day, and only a small subsection of those might actually be passed by the House and the Senate and signed by the President for signature. So that, that funnel is really, really large, and we need you to help us with that. I also need you to help us with the people who aren't our already on board. Uh, so make sure you're reaching out to people who are not natural allies of yours to let them know that this is important to you as well. Um, don't continue to you know, knock on the friendly doors, also knock on the doors that are not so friendly as well to let them know what's important and tell them how uh, challenging your, your perspective is. Terrific. Thank you uh, to our panelists, Congressman Don Bacon, Congresswoman Chrissy Houlihan. We look forward to seeing some of you uh, that will be joining for the, the staff reception uh, this evening with the uh, staff of the Four Country Caucus. And uh, until then, have a great rest of the day.